Welcome, parents. I know many of you are busy working on your math challenge that is on your table, so later Mr. McCann will talk about that a little bit. But quite often, we use such methods in our classrooms where children have to problem solve, try something out. You think you've almost got it, and then you realize there's a few tiles that are not not um, complete yet. So this microphone actually helps the HCAM recording. This will be recorded for families to view at a later date. It's not going to help make my voice louder, um, so I'll just try to talk with a good volume level here. My name is Lauren Dubow. I know many of you here. I am the principal of the Center School and tonight we have a presentation for you with staff pre-K, well not pre-K, I apologize. I guess I represent pre-K, but um, K through three, talking about math. What are ways that you can instill a love of learning and what are some key takeaways that are essential to learn and master at kindergarten, first grade, second grade? What are some of those highlights and standards that we are looking for children to really be secure in? Some of them you may be familiar with. Hopefully um, you leave with a clear understanding of what are some things to reinforce at home and perhaps why. Uh, some of our focus might be a little different than when we were in school ourselves. How we teach math might be a little different, um, and we hope that you feel more comfortable with that um, by the end of this evening. So as we speak, everyone will introduce themselves, as you might not know them from a differing building. And right now I'm going to pass it off to Mr. McCann. He is the assistant principal at Elmwood. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. It's great to see people out to talk about math. Um, I actually was having kind of a, a funny conversation this afternoon with uh, a friend who's not a teacher in this building and I, I happened to put up just the first slide and this friend of mine kind of looked at it and goes, oh, that's going to be deadly, huh? <laughs> Good luck tonight. And I was like, what? what are you talking about? I don't understand. And he said, well, I mean, really? That's going to be fun? I said, yeah, it's going to be fun. What, what, ha what, happened to, what happened to you? Like, when did you break up with math? And uh, he said, probably around um, ninth grade. Ninth grade. And I said, OK, uh, well, at least it was a little later you know, than K-5. But uh, what was it? Was it that the content uh, just became too complex, or was it not engaging? He thought about it for a minute and he said, um, for me, it, it just, it, it wasn't applicable. It, it wasn't engaging anymore. And I, I, I wasn't having any conversations with, with people in terms of my teachers or adults who made it fun. And I said, I'm sorry that happened to you. You should come. And he, had a, he, he couldn't come. Um, but uh, we felt like... Uh, the, this is an important to, topic to talk about because the two things that we really want to share with you tonight and, and, and have a conversation with you about tonight are uh, what we do with uh, students and, and often our own children uh, that help to develop that interest and engagement and, and love for, for math. Um, and this is a question that we get from parents quite a bit. It's a very frequent question. And the other question that we get a lot is, so what exactly does my child need to know by the end of this year? Um, even if that information has gone out you know, in paper form or electronic form or the teacher shared it, we still get the question because I, I, I myself have to remind myself of uh, you know, what is my son, I have two kids, what does my child need to do uh, by the end of the academic year this year? Um, so those are the two big questions that we felt would be important to, to address and would be most helpful to, to parents. Um, so one of the things I wanted to start off by sharing was uh, I was a teacher myself. I taught, uh, actually something I, I don't think I've shared with uh, other folks, I taught early childhood for a year. I taught second grade, third grade, fourth grade uh, for probably a total of about 10 years and then I was a math coach. Uh, in Wayland, Massachusetts, um, and I always loved math, uh, and I always found that when I was a classroom teacher and then as a math coach, I found it uh, to be something for me because I had a, a passion and enthusiasm for math to be able to kind of give that to other people. Um, and so uh, this is something that's really important to me and I think is really important for kids to, to see and know about, and I'm, I'm glad you're all here. 
Uh, and I, I want to share some of the things that, uh, as a teacher and as a math coach, and, and things that we've all talked about as administrators and teachers, that we've seen as patterns and trends over time um, that have helped kids to engage in math um, and tend to have a, a really positive impact on their outlook in terms of the subject of math. Um, so I want to share some things and you might look at them and you might say those seem really obvious um, but often when you know I share these things with parents they say yeah that that is kind of an obvious thing but but thank you for reminding me like that's that's something that I don't always do and I can do and it's a really simple thing um, so these are things that we've seen you know over you know many years I've been doing this for about 20 years um, and this is something that I just continue to see with those students who are engaged with math these are the things that often come up for them um, I also want to let you know that I'm not an expert in the area of math. Yes, I was a math coach for a little while, but you could argue many of the points that I'm going to make tonight. You could say, well, I don't agree with that, and you could be right. So these are just some ideas and, and things that we've seen kind of rise to the top in terms of uh, math engagement. Uh, number one, adults and other influential people uh, who talk positively about math. Uh, and I want to give you a couple of examples of what that might look like. I'll give you a, an example uh, from the classroom, but also a, a parent example, because I am both. I have two kids. Um, so I find it uh, a lot of fun for me personally, but also for students, uh, when math is presented as something that is fun, cool, interesting, and humorous. Uh, I try to kind of incorporate as much humor as possible in, in math, and that may sound weird. Uh, but here's what I mean. i just give you a really small example of uh, how I might introduce uh, a math topic uh, in my classroom. I'm not saying you should do this exact thing with this particular resource, but just so you get a sense of uh, like how that might be done and what that might look like. Uh, this is often how I introduce uh, these puzzles right here. Uh, to my students when I was a classroom teacher and as a math coach and, and I still do. So it looks a little bit like this and I'm actually going to put on a little act right here for two, two seconds. I want you to imagine we're in the classroom. Then I go back to work, and I leave that on the side of the classroom, and I don't say a thing about it for days. <laughs> and they start to kind of, what's that thing? Now there's some whispers over here. And, uh, somebody might come up, you know, maybe later on in the day and say, what is that? There's this, thing, you know, I think caution's supposed to mean like dangerous or something. Um, you know, what? And I say, no, you, you just, if you, just let's leave that there. Just not, we might talk, well, no. Just let's not believe it. And day two, there's a little more. And then day three, there's a little more talk. And, Day by, f by day four and five, kids are, you know, coming up to you, you know. Could we please address whatever, you know, that is? You know, I told my mom about that last night, and, you know, she was a little concerned that you brought this thing in that has, you know, caution. What's in there? Um, and I would wait a whole five days before I talk about it. Building anticipation. Um, I've seen uh, teachers do the same type of anticipation building in kind of the same way of setting up something in a humorous way in reading where they uh, might take a, a new set of books and wrap them in in Christmas paper or holiday paper and they would present them to the class you know in the same type of way you know they leave this pile of gifts 
So it's not necessarily that, you know, it's just math, but it's the presentation of it. You know, it's kind of silly. It's kind of funny. You know, I'm letting you know that there's something over there that I think is going to be really cool. And I could have just said, so, you know, we're going to take a look at this puzzle. Let's try it out. You know, that, that you'd still have some students who would look at that and say, oh, yeah, this is, this is engaging. But I'll get 99% doing it that way. I might still have one or two who are looking at that going, eh, not really that interested. But I'll get them. I'll get them over time. Um, so that's, that's just one little example. Um, and, and, and I share this next little piece. And, and when I share it, I, I, I preface this by telling you that I, I've had friends of mine and family of mine tell me that I am weird uh, when, when I tell them this. Uh, and I'm OK with that. Um, I actually take some of the things that uh, I think are particularly engaging with my own children. Uh, and I bring them home, and I do the same type of thing. Um, so I take puzzles like this. I have base 10 blocks at my house, which uh, I tell other teachers about that, and they go, oh, my God, why would you, you know, why would you do that? Um, but those are the kinds of things that I want to present to my kids in kind of a silly, engaging way and have them wonder, what is that? How do you use that? Like, what's the difference between this little unit cube and this long and this flat? Uh, to the point now where I have my daughter, uh, who every night at dinner uh, gets a little upset with me. Now, she's four, uh, but she gets a little upset with me if we haven't done a math problem. And she says it just like that, and she kind of stamps the table with her hand. And that's just something that we do. Uh, and I say, you know, I'm going to ask you a problem. I don't know if you're going to be able to do this. You know, and she's at the point where, um, you know, she's just doing one-to-one -one correspondence. She's four years old, you know, so I'm asking her five plus four. Um, but I'm making it and talking about it in a way where it's exciting. You know, can you do this? You know, I'm not sure. It could be a little too hard. And just that little shot of enthusiasm for her is enough to want to count my fingers and get it right. Um, so... You know, I try to make it fun, I try to make it interesting, uh, cool and humorous, and, and we've seen you know, when teachers do that, when parents do that with their students, uh, that tends to instill a curiosity, that tends to instill you know, a level of engagement um, that you know, we want to see from students. Um, in regards to things that uh, students are learning at school, um, I think it's really important to talk about uh, what they're learning at school and ask a lot of questions and be really curious with them. So every day my kids come home and I ask them, you know, what did you learn at school today? Um, I have uh, one child who tends to be really talkative and I have one child who refuses to tell me a thing about what happened at school except for what happened on the playground. Uh, my son will not tell me what happened in reading. He will not tell me the book he read. I know you read a book. He will not tell me what he did in math. Uh, I reach out to the, the teacher because he does not want to talk about it. I think it's just beyond him. He's like, I, I'd rather talk about other stuff. Um, and I reach out to the teacher and I ask, what are you working on? Um, and I ask questions and I'm very curious about you know, the kinds of things that you're doing at school. And can you explain to me, you know, I heard from Mrs. Savage you know, over at the school that you guys are working on number bonds. I don't, know what the, I don't know what those are. I know what those are. But I don't know what those are. Can you explain that to me? And then slowly he'll start to come out with a little bit. Um, so I ask a lot of questions and I'm very engaged and very interested in what it is that he's learning, what it is that she's learning. And I ask a lot of questions and say, can you explain to me how that works? Uh, and then I think the thing that's really important that I want to mention is that if there are questions about what they're working on, um, I try to present uh, the response to that question as, um, we're going to figure this out together. Let me try that with you. Uh, especially if there happens to be an error 
Uh, sometimes uh, something will come home and the publishing company might have made an error, or maybe the teacher is signing something that there's an error on it. It could be too hard, too easy, and I just look at them and I say, let's figure it out. Um, I know, you know, there's stuff on uh, the internet that you can find in two seconds about, uh, you know, things that come home. And can you believe this, you know, came home, you know, to a parent. And you see that every other week on, like, you know, the Yahoo banner or whatever, uh, you know, new site there is. And, and I always look at that and I say, that there's a different way to approach that. You know, if the parent is uh, looking at that, if I were to look at that and say to my child, like, can, can you believe that? You know, what, what are they giving you? Um, I think that that says something, you know, about that particular subject or the, you know, they don't necessarily want to engage in that uh, because of the fact that, you know, I'm responding to it in a negative way. So if there is a question or there's something that we're wondering about or if it's really hard, I say, let's figure it out together. Uh, I also think that for students who demonstrate a, a real interest and engagement in math, one of the things that works really well is they learn skills uh, and develop an understanding for uh, the math slowly, uh, over time, uh, but with consistency. Uh, when a student uh, looks at math on a regular basis, a consistent basis, um, I think it's easier for it to go in and acquire that knowledge than if we say, okay, so this is just a academic year thing, as opposed to, you know, in the summer, um, you know, we're free. We don't, need to, we don't need to worry about it. You know, we do math all summer because math is something that happens every single day. I'm using math every single day. It's not just for a particular time of year. Uh, when my kids were born, someone said to me, um, are you going to read to them every night? Well, of course I'm going to read to my children every night. Why wouldn't I read to my children every night? I want them to become lifelong readers. And then they said, are you going to do math with them every night too? Oh, I didn't think about that. I don't know. I mean, he was six months old at the time. And then they said, you should check out this website. It's called Bedtime Math. There's this idea out there that if you read to your child, then why not talk about math for two minutes, even if you were just counting up and down? Something as simple as that. What if you ask them one math problem, and it takes you know, two minutes? You know, what would that do over the course of 365 days, you know, times nine, 10 years? What kind of impact would that have on their level of engagement with math and their ease with certain ideas? over 10 years, probably a lot. So now we read a story, and it's not always easy to find that time. As a parent, it's very, very busy. It's hard to be a parent. Uh, but that's something that I've said to myself, I want to make sure I do that. So dinner time for us, I don't do it all like in the bed, you know, book and then math. We do the, the math at the dinner table. It's usually about two or three minutes. My daughter asked me a question, he asked me a question, and then the readings, you know, in bed. But every single day we try to plug that in. Slowly, consistently, over time. Uh, we talk a lot about what the math is used for. Uh, why is this applicable to my life? Because we're shopping all the time. We're adding and subtracting all the time. I'm estimating how much I'm spending all the time I'm shopping and using money every single day. I do a lot of cooking in my house so there's fractions and we're working with quarts and pints every single day. We build a lot of stuff in my house so we're using fractions all the time and I want my, my kids to know that's something that this is used for. So why are you learning those addition and subtraction problems in second and third grade? because you're going to use this every single day, all the time. Uh, and finally, uh, games with adult interaction. And I don't think there's, there's anything wrong with uh, tech. There's some really, really good tech stuff out there. There's some great games. There's some great programs. Uh, there's some great apps. Um, but one of the things that uh, we do a lot uh, in my house is we look at uh, 
games that involve cards, dice, and dominoes. And if you take a look at uh, that five right there, uh, there's this term called subitizing, very formal math term, maybe some of you know that, uh, which means you can look at a pattern of dots or an arrangement of items and you can quickly know how many there are. So if I showed you a six and a five right next to each other and I flashed that on the screen for about one and a half seconds, I would imagine uh, that you would probably be able to say 11. It was just one and a half seconds. Now if I took those same 11 dots and I arranged them in some sort of weird formation and I did that one first, one and a half seconds. It would be a greater range of answers. Some people would say nine, some people would say 13, I don't know, was it 10, was it 11? Some people would get it right. <clears throat> but when they're arranged in a certain way, like on cards, dice, and dominoes, your brain knows what a five looks like. Your brain knows that a six looks like dot, dot, dot. So by playing a lot of those games that involve cards, dice, and dominoes, kids are starting to recognize those, what they call them visual clusters of dots. <clears throat> and if I'm playing a game that involves two dice, I'm doing a whole lot of addition without even realizing that I'm subitizing and adding numbers. Because if I'm getting a six and a five on my roll, you'll notice after a while a student that plays with two dice and rolls a six and a five just says, that's an 11. They're not sitting there going, one, two. At first they are, but after a while they're not. They're just, they just know it's a six, it's a five, and it's an 11. That helps with math facts. Uh, interesting little fact right here. This is actually uh, one of the original boards for chutes and ladders. <coughs> it was a traditional uh, India, a game from India. I think it was originally called uh, Vices and Virtues. You can still get uh, snakes and ladders online. Uh, but this is what it looked like before Milton Bradley came along and, and took it. Uh, they, they saw it. They thought it was a great game. And they said, well, we can't have snakes on our game. So they turned it into chutes and ladders, made it a little bit nicer for kids. Uh, that's a great game because uh, you can't really see it very well here, but there are 100 squares, and it's a 100 grid. You're rolling dice, and you're slowly seeing uh, the number sequence from 0 to 100. Uh, so we play that game all the time. Uh, and my daughter's counting from 38. Okay, six more. How much is that? Now I'm on the 44. So she's seeing all those numbers from 0 to 100 again and again and again. And I almost uh, took this slide off because uh, uh, I'm actually going to go through it pretty quickly because I think a lot of people know that there are certain things that just kind of come out of our mouths that we say that don't necessarily help a student develop like that love of math and all of us say these things you know they, they, they've come out of my mouth I've said these things but I think that they're not super helpful so I do preface this by saying if if you've said these things like it's okay your kids are still in a wonderful place um, but these are things that we say that we don't feel like they help develop that love uh, don't worry I was bad at math too uh, my child just isn't good at math. It's just not their thing. Uh, and I don't even get this. What is your, what is your teacher giving you? Um, I think as uh, teachers and administrators, you know, sometimes we joke, you know, if, if you were to take the topic of reading and you were to take this sentence right here, it just isn't their thing, <clears throat> and you were to say that about reading, you know, how, uh, how would that make you feel about your child? You know, it's reading, it's just not their, it's just not their thing. Yeah. Like, it's got to be their thing. You know, 99% of the code all around us is alphabetic. It's, it's so incredibly important. But numbers are everywhere as well. So to say, you know, math just isn't their thing, that's not going to ha have a positive impact on, on your child. And I truly believe that it's not hardwired. I know that a lot of people could argue, no, I think it's hardwired, like, genetically. I don't believe it's in anyone's blood. 
that you're a mathematician or not a mathematician. Any student, any person can do the math that we're doing, you know, here in these buildings. <clears throat> uh, learning skills quickly are passed when they're needed. It becomes more stressful. I think students are really savvy and they start to pick up. If I was supposed to have learned something, you know, two or three years ago and I still haven't acquired that skill, if I don't have my basic addition subtraction facts and I'm in fifth grade, I think students start to realize everyone else is getting this and it becomes more stressful and it can create a situation where the student says, I'm really bad at math. <clears throat> when really that was just a basic fact issue that could have been solved really easily and still can. So if you're playing games with your children, something that also helps are social emotional skills, turn taking, accepting loss. So don't always set it up that they win. It's okay that they, no, but which is well, hard. Let them win parents, sometimes. Right? <laughs> but I mean, we try to teach them, you can say good game, oh maybe I'll win next time, trying to teach them what to say instead of swiping, because sometimes that happens at school when we've got um, candy land, shoots and ladders, checkers or whatnot, but accepting that yeah. loss um, is important, waiting for your turn, because all of a sudden you see a move you want to make, but it's not your turn. There, there's a lot that goes into games with children, and just having them think critically to if it's a strategic game, even tic-tac-toe, um, planning where you're going, or trying to make a match with card games. Um, you know, the, the tools that are here can be used in so many multi-purpose ways, and I think we'll talk about that a little later. Um, and actually, you're going to get to take some of these home tonight, and just, just have fun while you reinforce math with your child. Last point I wanted to make was uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, basic facts and how important they are. Um, I uh, worked with uh, a student named uh, Julia and uh, she was in 10th grade uh, and she uh, started to talk to me. Uh, I was uh, tutoring her after school. She was in college geometry uh, and she said, uh, I really, I think I'm, I'm just not a good mathematician. I, I, this is not, I'm not good at math. And I said, tell me what's going on. And she said, um, I go in and I have to take the math test in 10th grade. And it, I've got a 52-minute window. That's the block. And if I don't finish, then I can come back to the study hall. <clears throat> For every math test, I'm having to come back to my study hall. I'm never finishing. Clearly, I don't get it. We went through and we actually looked at all of her math assessments for the first you know, few months of school. And what we realized was every single one of the things that she was getting stuck on and every single one of the errors that she was making was computation. Tenth grade, computation. Just basic addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And I said to her, if you master these things, it will allow you to spend more of your time thinking about the complex algorithm as opposed to just doing the basic computation. And we worked on it and it improved her scores dramatically and her confidence dramatically. But it was uh, an issue for her in third, fourth, and fifth grade and it was something that ju she just never was really facile with. And so that really slowed her down as some of those algorithms, I mean if you've looked at like an ellipse or a, a parabola and like how big those equations are and how many numbers and variables and positives and negatives there are in that, they're incredibly complex. And you've got to spend most of your time looking at the structure of it versus trying to look at just the basic facts and how you add, you know, four and two and divide this number by this number. It was slowing her way down. All of her mental energy was going to computation. So if in second, third, fourth, and fifth grade, we can <coughs> master the addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, it makes the math and the skill and the objective uh, much, much easier because we're not focusing so much on the computation, the mental energy put towards the computation. So I think we can actually work off the green sheet for the rest of this if we need to because that's basically the rest of the PowerPoint. Um, but I'm going to turn this over to uh, Sandy Maynard. 
Uh, she's, uh, well, I'll let her introduce herself and we're going to get into a little bit about the grade level expectations so you know what do kids need to know at each of these different grade levels. Thank you. So um, my name is Sandy Maynard and I'm the math tutor over at Center School. Um, I've been there I think about five years now and I've got about 20 years of experience at different grade levels um, teaching so I'm and I've always taught math in some some way or another in all different grades I'm really excited about being at center school because we're really laying this foundation this really strong groundwork for kids um, as they move on um, up into the upper grades um, there's so many skills that to adults might seem very straightforward, but to kids are actually really complex um, and not as simple as they may seem. So at kindergarten, really um, the most important concept area is number. We're, we're, we're spending all a lot of our time um, learning how to identify numbers in all their different forms, all the different ways they might be written. Um, kids mm -hmm. are learning how to, as part of that, le learning how to count. They're oral counting up to 100. They're talking about patterns in those numbers while they're counting. Um, kids are counting, as Aiden said, forwards and backwards, and eventually working on counting starting from any number, not just one. Um, so one of the things you can do at home that I think is really effective um, and really helps kids with their flexibility with numbers and just feeling confident about numbers is just counting with them every single day in all different ways. So you might, you know, if you have younger children, kindergarten or first grade, you might start at one or start from the lower numbers. Later, as your kids get older, you can start counting, starting and stopping from any two-digit number or three-digit numbers as they get older. Um, kids in kindergarten are really focused on counting forward and backward from zero to ten and then even beyond that. So you can practice with your child at home, pick a number of the day and start counting from that number. You can count sets, um, groups of objects. So um, when my kids were little, we used to count um, snack items for them to eat. So we might put Cheerios on the table and I would say, um, you know, let's count and see how many are in this pile. Um, another skill that you can work on with your child at home is counting out different groups, um, different amounts of, of objects. So you might ask your child um, in kindergarten or first grade, let's count out eight things. What would eight look like? And have your child practice that one-to-one -one correspondence and counting. Um, also at kindergarten, um, besides really learning about number, kids are also talking about shapes and their attributes, which we, um, we talk about a lot in first grade as well. So um, as Aiden was talking about applying all of that information to the real world, there's shapes everywhere. You can play, um, you know, I spy a shape game at home, looking at different objects in your house and asking your child, you know, what shape does that look like? Does that look like a circle or a cone or a hexagon? Um, all of those things. So at kindergarten, I would say at home, the most important things would be counting um, and working with your kids on recognizing numbers. At school, we do a lot of um, kinesthetic activities when we're helping kids learn their numbers. At home, you can do the same thing. We do a lot of writing with different materials, so you can put sand or salt in a dish and have kids practice making numbers that way. You can use shaving cream or pudding in a bag and have kids trace numbers. Um, being confident with numbers and number names really helps kids as they move through kindergarten and into first grade, as they start looking at two-digit numbers. Um, knowing for sure with fluency the names of numbers is a really strong skill that uh, helps them as they go forward. Um, in first grade, um, in addition to continued counting in more difficult ways like skip counting, so kids start to learn how to count by tens, count by fives, um, they're also counting by tens off the decade as we say. So instead of just saying 10, 20, 30, 40, which most kids can recite, um, in first grade they start to learn how to count by tens starting from any number. Um, and this really sets the stage for an understanding of place value, which is one of the other really big concepts in first grade. Um, towards the end of the year, kids start to get a lot more uh, formal activities <coughs> with place value. And again, that's one of those things that seems pretty simple to adults, but for kids it's a huge conceptual shift to begin thinking about groups of 10 as one single unit. So being real confident 
in counting by tens and then counting on from those numbers helps them when they're using place value and trying to understand our number system and how numbers are, um, how numbers are made. So um, in first grade also, there's, there's always a lot of talk about fact fluency um, and basic number facts. So I'm sure that all of you, actually how many people here have students at center? I know you do. Oh, everybody, almost everybody. Okay, awesome. So you guys have probably heard all this, that in kindergarten, um, students are working towards fluency with addition and subtraction facts to five. In first grade, kids are working on fluency with addition and subtraction facts to 10. So um, as Aiden pointed out, lots of activities that can help them feel confident and um, flexible with those numbers help them with those facts. So using dice and playing cards can help kids understand um, and really commit those facts to memory. Um, in addition to learning the facts to 10, students in first grade also start to talk about addition strategies to help them with facts to 20. Um, so once kids know the names of all the numbers from kindergarten, they can put that together in first grade with their basic facts to 10. Then they start talking about uh, numbers that can be found within numbers. We have lots of different terms for it, but we often call it parts, finding parts of a number. So in first grade and kindergarten, kids start to break down numbers to 10 and look at the parts that make up that number. So they might know eight as, well, that's an eight, but it also could be a four and a four, it could be a five and a three, it could be a, and so on. Um, knowing those fluently helps them with the basic facts to 10 and also helps them when they're trying to learn facts to 20. So once they know that they can break apart numbers, they can use that as a strategy to try to add larger and larger numbers up to 20. So first grade is a time when kids are really learning their fact fluency and also building those strategies. Um, we talk about doubles facts. We talk about using those doubles facts like five plus five and six plus six to help them with more difficult facts like six plus seven. Once you know a doubles fact, you can know a doubles fact plus one more. Um, and making 10 is a really important strategy. Um, we, in first grade, students work with this a lot. Um, once kids know numbers that go together to make 10, they can use that to help them add larger numbers. So if a student is trying to add eight plus four, they, they know that four could also be two and two, so they can think, oh, well, eight plus two is just 10, and then I know 10 plus two is 12, that's easy because we've already learned those facts as well. So um, all of those strategies come together in first grade as kids are really learning to put all of their skills together and become more flexible with computation. Um, in first grade, um, Kids also work with shapes and measurement as well, building on those skills that they learned in kindergarten. Um, and they start to talk about composing or putting together shapes in first grade to make um, more complex shapes. So they talk about putting two triangles together and um, making other shapes out of that. And that's all part of first grade as well. Um, at home, I think for, for first grade students, it's very important to continue that daily um, counting practice and daily number practice, um, as well as practicing facts in, in any way that you can find that's fun, um, that's brief, so that you can keep it kind of fun and interesting. Um, as Ada mentioned, there's lots of tools on the table for you guys to take home. Any game with dice or cards is a really great way to help your child practice facts. Um, often games can be altered. If the game usually uses one dice, you can often change the game and just use two dice and ask your child to be adding those two numbers together. Um, one of the games I play with kids a lot um, when I'm working at Center School is um, the traditional war game. We call it war. At school we call it top it. We don't call it war. Um, <laughs> but we often play addition top it and you can alter a deck of cards to work on up to whatever number your child is comfortable. So you can remove whatever numbers you want. Um, I often play with kids using only the cards up to five. Um, and each time a person takes a turn, they turn over two cards and add those together um, and then compare their sum with their partner's sum. So you, you're kind of, um, there's, there's a lot of math thinking involved in that <laughs> game. You can encourage your child to, child to try to um, add the numbers in other ways besides counting all of them. So often when kids are 
first learning how to count, they'll start by touching each object on the card and counting everything. Even though they know that card is a five, a lot of kids are still working on trusting that that's a five, so they'll continue to keep counting every number. The more practice they have, the better they are at saying, oh, that's a five, and I've got three more, so five, six, seven, eight, and they'll count on the other three. Eventually, they work towards, and you can encourage them, to work towards going five and three. Oh, right, I know that one. That's eight. So um, playing those kinds of games are really helpful for kids. It keeps it fun, and it keeps the numbers familiar to them and helps them with confidence. So um, when they come into school and they start building on those skills and learning more difficult concepts, they've already got this whole bank of knowledge behind them and they can say, oh yeah, I've seen something like that before. Now we're just talking about adding 15 plus three, so it's kind of the same thing. So um, giving kids that foundation and that base of knowledge at, at the early years is really helpful as they move on and things start to become more difficult. Um, as Aiden was mentioning, kids get to that point where they don't have those basic skills and that foundation behind them and they start to kind of shut down and say, oh, it's just too hard, it takes me too long to add these numbers, I don't have any strategies, and they, and they stop really working hard. So it's really important at these ages to really build up those basic skills. That's a question up for you. Yeah. Um, so I, I was kind of surprised by the, um, it seems like the message was very much memorization. I mean, I'm someone who loved math, but I loved math because it made sense. I didn't have to memorize it. Um, and I feel like the message has been very much like, know your facts, like memorize them. Just, you gotta know them, you gotta know them. And to me, like, all you're saying, what you're saying is making sense, and I'd much rather play dominoes than just grill right. them. But let me tell you, like, you know, when, when they have that 60 second test, and there's a timer, I, I, I did this own experiment with my son, which like we played and you know, he learned. But you know what made him do it in 40 seconds was just timing him, timing him, timing him, timing him, and he got faster and faster and faster. And I was like, is this really what I should, like it felt so wrong to just keep timing <laughs> right, and doing drill. math. Cause I'm like, that's not what math is. Like math right. is dominoes and cards and dice and you know, and so, but I mean, as a working parent, like you don't have time to do timing and dominoes and puzzles and, you know, so you're like, well, like we got 15 minutes, so let's just time you so that you do well and you get your little reward, you know, from your teacher on Monday morning. Yeah. And so I, I, so I just wonder about that. I would that, say play like, the math time. game. We can work on the timing at yeah. school and the fluency. So while we want this to become familiar so children can look at that five and know it's a five, the frequency of it for the fluency aspect, the reason we work on that is so it frees up their working memory. So as they get older, they're quick with it, and then they right. can get but into I that just, deeper I'm problem. I was just surprised yeah. that at six years old, it wouldn't be more about discovery. I mean, they're still trying to like get the brain hand right yeah. the five like, so it's both, right? Not only you focusing know, like, like, on timing, you know, but we like, still have to build up that capacity. So yeah. these are things, what Sandy was talking about, the games, those are things that we do as part of our math program, but we also work on the fluency right. and building up the speed with it. Right. Um, I think that the, I think the, the deep test, understanding... The, the timer is stressful for them. And they, like, he, he felt much better, like, I'm going to get that thing on Monday right. because I timed him. Yeah. But I think he actually would have learned more math if I played with him. And we I don't know. That was my feeling as a mom. Personal goals. So if you if you got three the last time, okay, great, three. You're working on it. Maybe you'll get four this time. So we work on improving your personal best. Some kids, we know at this level, there's a lot involved. You're thinking of a number. You're writing. You've got the fine motor involved. Right. You've got that. There's so many. Um, yeah. Yeah. There are yeah, so many so factors. Right. So we do recognize that. But we still have to attend to it of building up the fluency. Right. If you, so, look, at, and, if you yeah. look at the time frame yeah. on just addition and subtraction, <clears throat> that actually begins in K and ends at two ish. Yeah. Okay, so you're doing some work in pre K. And there are going to be some students who are still working on that third, of course. But K2 right. is addition, subtraction. Right? So through 20, meaning nine plus nine, and everything up to that. Um, so if you think about how much time there is in K, one, and then two, our focus at the beginning is really conceptual understanding. There's, there's no timer the way they, at the beginning. But the way the kids evaluate themselves is, 
we yeah. got that big. Right. 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 But we and do. So my son oh, was well, like, by the end of the third year, we in second yeah. grade, we do want them to be able to. Of course. Do it fluently right. <laughs> because we've been working on it for two years and eight yeah. months. Um, we want them to be able to do that efficiently. So we're slowly moving them from the super concrete cubes, like count out three, count out two, put them together. What is that? There's a total, it's five. Up to, what's three and two, it's five. Right, I, I, just, I just worry like so early in the year, like what, he's already like, I'm not that good at math, you know? And I'm just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like it's October yep. of first grade, <laughs> you know? But it's like, I didn't do it in 60 seconds. And I'm yeah. just like, that's not math. Like, you know, let's do math, which is like fun and, and discovery. And, you know, he did a puzzle that was 48 pieces. And I, you know, he was saying like, what is 16 plus 16, mom? And he's counting the eights to make the 48s. Right. And he's like discovering, and I'm like, this is math. Like, this yeah. is awesome. Like, we're having exactly. this great conversation. Yeah. But you know what, that's not gonna help him with his thing on Monday. What's gonna help him with his thing on Monday so that he feels like he's good at math is if I time him on those right. facts, you know? So, so I, I don't mean, know, that's why I'm here, because I'm yeah. like, this is not like, it right. just seems like a paradox. I think, and maybe um, going back to kind of Aiden's first slide where he was talking about that kind of positive reinforcement from the adult figure. So I'm sure in his classroom that he's getting positive reinforcement for all of the different parts of math that he's doing, not just that time test, but all of the discovery and all the deep understanding and all the conceptual learning that they're working on all the time in math. So earlier I was talking about breaking apart numbers. That's a huge part of the <coughs> learning that goes on in kindergarten and first grade. Kids are just learning what is four sure. all about, what is five all about, and that's what helps him probably be able to take out a question like, well, what is 16 plus 16, and know that he can count I mean, just knowing that he can count and find the total is huge. Like, that's huge math thinking right there. So maybe just the encouragement yeah, coming from all know, over like, saying, I'm not that worried is amazing. About him. I just was worried about his own perception. self-perception yes. because right. of this timer. Like, the bell goes off, and it's like, I'm not good at math. You know, like, that's ridiculous. Right. You know? Anyway, but I'm told that's what you got to do. And if I, I'm Mrs. Carver, the principal Hi. here at Elmwood School. Um, and if, if it were me, I would encourage you to keep doing, I think your instincts are really good about what math should look like. So if I were you, I would say, keep doing the things that you're doing and let him know every time that he, when he's doing that, what's eight plus eight and how do I get to 48, you say, you're really good at math. If he argues with you, he just wants to hear you say it again. It doesn't mean that he doesn't think he's good but it feels good when a grown-up says, you're really good at something. So sometimes people will say, my kids think they're not good at something because they keep complaining about it at home. And I often counter and say, they just wanna hear you say that again. You are really good at that. Just keep saying it. I think some of what we do as parents is self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you say it long enough, eventually they will get good because it builds some self-confidence. And kids will get faster when they understand the concepts. So as far as I'm concerned, the goal isn't let's make sure that every kid can do something in three minutes. It is assessed. I'm not saying that it's not. But I think kids will be quick with it when they have a deep understanding of math. When their foundation is solid, they're gonna, like you and I, who could stand there and, and go through the facts really quickly, they'll get there when they're developmentally ready for it and when they've had enough time to, to develop the understanding for it. So I think you have to say, this is just a thing that they do at school. Um, I would downplay that a lot and say, as you learn and grow, you're going to get faster at this. It's like running. If you said, let's see how fast you can run. When he first learned to run, he probably wasn't that fast. And now he can <coughs> probably run faster. And try to compare it to other developmental skills that kids are learning. I think that's a great question, though, because at, and Lauren, I want Lauren to have her chance to talk, too. Um, that we do a lot of timed things because it tells us that whether or not a kid has a solid understanding of something. So it gives us some important information, but it's not the most important thing we do. And that there's so many other aspects of math and so many ways <coughs> to think about number, which your son is obviously doing, that maybe those are the things you can kind of build up and say, wow, you know, that is really smart thinking and you, you know, you really know a lot about numbers and you know about 16 and, you know, all of those pieces go into being a really strong mathematician, not just the timed mm -hmm. part of it. Other, any other questions before I hand it over to Lauren? Do a second. Yeah. Yeah. 
I want to point out in second grade, you might look at what's written on here and say if there are four things, it's, it's equally distributed over the course of the year, and that's not the case. Uh, if you want to write in your notes there what the real emphasis is, you can. Um, so there are four things there, and each one is important, but they have a, a different weighting in terms of how much time is spent on each one. The real emphasis in second grade is the understanding of addition and subtraction with regrouping with two-digit and three-digit numbers. That's the huge piece. And I want to note that uh, there is uh, something that's a little bit different uh, with what we're doing than what we necessarily grew up with. We probably learned the standard algorithm of <coughs> crossing out numbers and carrying a one and things like that. That's not something that's part of second grade. Really third grade. That's okay. not something that's part of second grade. You probably will see things like something called an open number line or a 100 grid or expanded form addition and subtraction. All of those things are models and visuals that we use in second grade to really solidify the concept of place value and addition and subtraction with and without regrouping. That's the huge, huge emphasis in second grade. And I would encourage you if you're saying, I don't know what an open number line is. I don't know what expanded form or partial sums is. I would encourage you to reach out to the, t the classroom teacher and say, could you show me what exactly that is and what that means? Because if we jump to the standard algorithm too quickly, which really comes in around the end of third grade, fourth grade, then what happens is we kind of get rid of that foundation of what is place value. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, my name is Lauren Mack. I'm a third grade teacher here at Elmwood. 17 years teaching, seven <coughs> years here in the third grade. Um, I wanted to um, add on to what Aiden said. Most of my parent-teacher conferences this year have focused on some of the new ways that we do addition and subtraction because in the third grade we go up to a thousand and I've spent a lot of conferences just showing parents the open number line, partial sums, um, the expanded form, actually drawing and using base 10 blocks. I do teach the standard algorithm very briefly for students who really have a good understanding of place value. So if I don't feel like they're um, showing that deep understanding, it's much better for me to see them be able to break apart a number into ones, tens, and hundreds, and really show the <coughs> understanding of adding those groups together. Um, that is a carryover, really, from second grade. I think at Elmwood, um, we've made huge changes in teaching with addition and subtraction. Um, a lot to do with Mr. McCann has um, had a lot to do with that. In the third grade, I would say the most exciting part in math is multiplication. The kids go nuts. And so you really do <laughs> see that excitement. I, I started my first multiplic multiplication <coughs> class by telling the students, this is the day you've all been waiting for. And they're like, is that in recorders in the third grade? They jump <laughs> out of their seats. They're so excited for multiplication. Um, and we go for multiplication. Um, the way that I have been doing it the last few years is, yes, we teach the facts, but we're teaching them ways to learn the facts. Um, we break it into, I have a sort of pattern that I do, you know, the twos, the fives, the tens, the zeros, the ones. And then, you know, some of the other ones are more difficult, like the nines, the seven, the eights, all of those. But we teach the kids to break down facts. So if they don't know um, five times seven, but they know what the act but they know five <coughs> times five, and they know two <coughs> times five, they can add those together. So we really work on breaking down the numbers. Um, from multiplication, it really, um, we do a lot of visual models with arrays and groups of objects. So that array model actually um, provides a wonderful segue right into uh, rectangular arrays and dealing with area. So we do a lot of work with that as well. Um, we also do a lot of work with the distributive property and multiplication. We haven't started that yet, but we're going to start that soon. From there, we go into <coughs> division. 
in all the multiplication and division facts, it's up to 100, but I don't think it's bad to learn your 11s and 12s. It doesn't hurt, because you're going to need to know it the next year anyways. Um, the other things that are a huge focus in the third grade are fractions, especially unit fractions, um, developing an understanding of fractions, understanding equivalent fractions with visual models. So it is okay, you want students using uh, fraction bars or fraction circles. You can find those um, at a, a teaching store. You can also order them off Amazon, like I order everything else. So there's a lot of ways that you can work on that as home, at home as well. Um, the other big part of third grade is classifying, describing, and analyzing two-dimensional shapes. So we spend a lot of time with that as well. As far as the fact fluency, Aiden has talked about that. It's, you know, we do a lot of fact practice. I suggest, just like we've <coughs> talked about the dice, the cards, there's a lot of spinner games that work really well um, for fact fluency, but I have a fourth and sixth grade daughter, so I know how important it is to learn facts. We do it all different ways. Flash cards in the car. Um, I have these things called wrap-ups, where if you have a child that really likes to use their hands and be busy, um, you can look at up them on Amazon, but it's like a string that you wrap around this plastic piece that will be the multiplication. You can get in anything, addition, subtraction. I have a couple sets of those in the classroom. Also, the um, multiplication or any fact cards that are the triangle shape, so they show the fact family are very useful. There's little electronic games. I mean, we have the technology. You can always use the technology as well. But I think playing games at home um, is one of the best ways to do it. Um, and just, just doing oral facts in the car or while they're waiting for dinner or making them answer a few things before they get to watch TV or something like that is also a really good way. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Are there um, good dice games for multiplication or? There's one really easy one that we're playing in class right now called Multiplication roll em. And literally, you just have two people play. You roll the <coughs> dice, and you multiply the two dice together. So, And then you circle whoever got a higher score. And then at the end of 18 rounds, mine has 18. But you don't even need the paper. You could just say, OK, we're going to do this 10 times for 10 rounds. The kids love it. I mean, I started off with just the six by six, but the kids started digging in my dice char jar and they found like numbers. It might have been our of <laughs> the six times 12, the 12 times 12. The other day I found them trying to multiply 15 times 17. I said, okay, yeah. that might take a little while, but they were breaking it down. So they were, that was part of that discovery that you were talking about because they were challenging themselves and it isn't a game form. But if, I'm sure if you reached out to any of your teachers, we all play that game. It's a great one. You can play that two card war on top yeah. of multiplication as well. Yeah. Or subtraction or. You anything. can really do it with anything. Anything. Yeah. yeah, just flip over two cards and multiply those. And Right. Remove any cards that you, that they're not ready to work on yet. So I just didn't, I never thought it were that way. Like my daughter and I play more all the time. Yeah. And I never thought of doing the two cards. Right. Yeah. The, the I, that's the game I find like the that. kids every year they just they can't get enough of that game. I yeah. And and I love that there's so many things happening mathematically in one game. It's a great. Right. Even well, at the end they can you know estimate who who they think you know how many cards do you think you have how many cards do you think you have let's count and find out and I mean there's just so many ways to build on that game. Yeah, because I have a preschooler, a second grader and a fourth grader, and they all want to play it, but they're all uh, obviously at different, different abilities. Levels. So right, it, right. You know, so, but I never thought of doing the yeah. two card and adding, or two card yeah. and multiplying, so that's, that's a really good option. <coughs> so, Mrs. Nickerson, if you took three of these home with you today, <laughs> you would give one when you played with your youngest, that you want that kiddo to just be looking at these dice and saying five, four, three, six, you know, counting. Or counting, if they're ready, looking at the dice inside and adding the two numbers together. You can roll two and add the numbers. You can do subtract. When I taught first grade, I taught every math skill I ever taught, I used dice. You can, um, there's a thousand, if you use your imagination, and everyone in this room, I think, has picked up the dice, kind of rolled them around, <laughs> put them back on the table, 
kids love dice. And so if you just, if you had a little jar of dice in your home um, and you put them on the table, and that wouldn't be, I think the mistake that parents make, and I probably did this myself, when you sit down and you say, listen, buddy, we got to work on math today. <laughs> and the way you say it sends your family up for, it's like saying you're on your way to the dentist or when are you going to clean your room. You, you, what you might hear yourself is, I'm presenting this as a distasteful task that nobody really wants to do, but we know it would be good for us. So you want to try not to do that anymore. And you put this beautiful, you know, take Aiden's um, cue tonight, get a jar, start collecting dice, um, put it in the middle of your table, like in a fishbowl or something, and just leave it there and see what happens. And then after a couple of days, start saying, what could we do with this? And let your kids tell you what you could do with it. And at night, I think what's hard is when you're working and you're busy and you're harangued and you think, oh, you know, good heavens, how am I gonna do all the things I'm expected to do as a parent? This would be something that would give you joy and when you feel joy about the thing you're teaching your kids, they, they, they kind of look over and think, what just happened? <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're practicing math, but everybody's having fun. So I know it, it's sort of, it, it seems silly to, for us to say, we just want you to have fun. Because you're thinking, but this really isn't that much fun. Because my kids aren't doing well <laughs> with it, and it's giving everybody stress. But if you don't have an end expectation for it, and you just say, let's play, you'll probably make up games on your own. Your kids will make up things that they could do together, and you will too. And next thing you know, you'll be thinking, look at all the things we did and how much, eventually a light bulb will go off and you'll say, that's what they mean by make this fun. We don't want families to go home with their tasks <coughs> and feel like they have to teach the kids the things that they did not learn in school. We want families to start helping kids build a foundation. Um, I think the only other thing I would add is that I think when kids are in elementary school, we compare our children so much. So I remember when my girls were little, they each, one of my girls learned to walk at eight months old, and one of my girls learned to walk at 13 months old. And I didn't worry about either one of them. And if they each walked in the room today, they are really good walkers. And you <laughs> never know which of them was which. You wouldn't say, I bet she walked slow. Um, but with reading tasks and math tasks, we do that. We, sit, we go to a cocktail party and we say, what, is your kid reading? <laughs> my kids started reading when they were six. Or, my, oh, my kids were reading when they were three. And we start putting all this pressure on each other to have these kids who can do these great things. And instead of doing that, I would suggest have some fun because they're going to be grown up before you know it, whether they're good at math or good, you know, they're going to be all grown up and you're going to wish you just had a bowl of dice to worry about. <laughs> so um, I want, I'm the closer in this show. Uh, I want to thank you for coming. Um, it shows that you care about your kids, that you care about math. There's a lot of resources that we have here for you. Um, so tonight is just sort of to whet your appetite about what, what's math. <coughs> if you leave here with more questions than you came in, you should reach out to the classroom teacher. I would say absolutely. Something that we're working on at Elmwood is creating, um, particularly in the second grade, but it's making its way to third grade too, is videos where teachers, I, I know we use phrases like open number lines and um, expanded form, and some of you might be all about that. Some of you are going to go right home and Google it and say, oh my gosh, I don't know what that means. So something that we're working on is creating videos where teachers are showing um, each other and, and also parents this is what it looks like to do a math problem using an open number line. So if you don't know what it means, that you could even ask your children, you know, are you, if they come home with a phrase like that, show me what that looks like. If I give you a math pro pro problem, could you show me using expanded form and see if they can. If they can't, then reach out to the teacher and ask for some ex explanations or reach out to <coughs> somebody that's here to say, do you have resources that you could share with me so this makes better sense? Um, certainly if your kiddo is struggling, the first thing you should do is let, your t let the teacher know. Uh, if math has become a, a big bummer in your house, let your teacher know and maybe back off a little bit so that you can sort of reset and say, I'm committed to making this fun. Because when people are crying, they're not learning. So if there's tears about the subject, step away and, and find your dice. <laughs> and we want everybody to take 
um, the, some dice home. If you have questions, we can answer them. But I know we're sort of over time. So. I think it would be great to have those resources because, I mean, obviously we all were educated in a different era. Right. <laughs> so it's just, it's all a foreign language. Right. Yes. So I think as much that we can, you know, whether it's online or nights like this, yeah. it's right. really helpful just to kind of know ahead of time and not, and not be right. reactive to right. like, oh, I, yeah. or spend your teacher conference having a lesson, you know? Like, <laughs> That's right. Because <laughs> you only have 15 minutes, so, you know, you want to talk about your kids. Well, so something we've been playing around with is maybe we have a link to where people could go and click on the, the whatever it is you're thinking about, right. whether it's open number line or place value yes, or yeah. that you can kind of find a directory where you could, one of our second grade teachers is creating some for the unit that they're working on right now. And it's just a two minute um, little video with a dry erase board where she's describing, this is, you don't see her, you see her hand and her beautiful penmanship, and she's writing out um, what it looks like to solve a problem. But I think what's hard, especially if there's trouble with, with anything, reading math or writing or anything in school, is that kids will start to say things like, that's not how she does it. Right. Right. And then you get into this big, yeah. you know, I was, a, I was an elementary school teacher when my kids were in elementary school, and I could hear my kids saying, yes, but she's not that kind of a teacher. I don't think she knows, but, you know. We knew nothing when our that's kids right. were going through. Well, my daughter right. told me I couldn't teach multiplication. <laughs> so, so we know what it's like on the parent's side, for sure. Definitely. Does anyone else have a yes. question that I they want to ask? If the kid knows the topic of what's being covered, let's say it's in, in my in my case, my kid knows addition, subtraction of until even three digits now. Mm -hmm. he, he just does the mind math and he comes up with a number. So now I want, I mean, he also started doing multiplication. He's in first grade, by the way. And division is something that he's starting as well. Now he wanted to know. So I have this big car, uh, like I think it's a card, which has all the multiplication. But I always wonder how it's being taught in the class because I don't want to confuse him with the different logic. And I'm always, and I, I understand that uh, they, they start teaching multiplication division in third grade, but can I introduce it now? If yes, what method should I use? Can I use the method that I was taught? Will it confuse them when they come to the class? <laughs> Yes, that's yes, right, yes, right. no. Right. <laughs> um, I, and I think that's a perfect question because I think, uh, you know, Aiden talked a little bit about the standard algorithm and what we worry about is that kids who aren't ready. <coughs> so sometimes kids can do things in their head but they don't quite understand. If you said to them, show me what that looks like, show me how you know, explain to me how you know that, sometimes kids will say things like, I just know it. So you feel eventually that kiddo might hit a wall where they don't just know it, and they might be a little bit more resistant to the, the, the foundational skills needed to get there. So I, I don't know if you have an answer, Aiden, that, um, that you're dying to give about this, but I think it's, it's, you should communicate with the teacher about, here's what I feel like my child can do. This is the things that I'm hearing at home. And ha let, your, let the teacher say, well, here's, Here's some of the language, and here's the direction I would have you go so that you don't do, I, I think it's wonderful that you're considering that you don't want to confuse, because I think that does happen. And, and, and as I said, kids are on, saying, um, that's not what they say. focus on word problems, more complex word problems. So you're building um, addition subtraction facts, but you're adding the language component, because sometimes that's very hard for children, is when you put the language in there, what are they asking me to do? What's the operation? Especially when there's a multi-operation in there. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, I, I agree with Anne. Reach out to the teacher and say, where are some opportunities to expand this at home? And um, almost like reading, when children just read a word, sometimes they have a hard time explaining how they knew it was a word. You, you know, we're teaching them strategies. And similarly in math, we want them to be able to show and understand, kind of prove, how do they know that's, that's actually five? How do you know that? Show me um, how you can break that apart. So having that surface knowledge and quick knowledge is wonderful, fabulous. We want to make sure there's that depth behind it to confidently stand up, explain it, and um, you know, show someone else what that means, because that just shows deep understanding. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, so I've got some, some dice, some eight, <coughs> some decks, some. Yeah, take a deck. Wanna... Oh, right. Oh, so there are purple forms on the table. If you take a minute um, to share with us 
some feedback. If there's something we didn't touch upon that you'd love to talk more about, um, if there's a way that we could tailor this, please just share your, your feedback with us so that we can make this better for next time. And thank you for being here.